Good morning, everyone. Uh, Jason Vanderbur, Building Code Program Manager for SPEAR. I'm sure all you guys know me. Um, if, if you didn't know, uh, two days ago was my official last full-time day at SPEAR. Um, but we'll, I'll be working part-time probably through January, fulfilling my obligations on my calendar. Um, if any of you folks are energy code nerds and think, man, I, that, that job Jason's had for the last handful of years seems like a good one. Uh, it, it has been fantastic. Oh, I know Karen says no. I, uh, trust me, I'm still going to find a way to get your cookies, Karen. Don't worry. Um, but it's I'll, I'll still be living in San Antonio. I'll still be doing some energy code trainings in Texas. It'll just be for NEMA. Um, but again, so I'm still available. I'll still I'll, I'll have this email through the first of the year. Um, after that, it'll be jvandiver at NEMA.org. Always happy to answer your energy code or HVAC questions. I typically will turn your HVAC questions over to somebody smarter than me, like, like the gentleman we have on this this morning, Russ King. Uh, but I, I'm gonna show a couple of slides real quick. And I know y'all have all seen this slide before and the reasons it's in Spanish is this was part of actually, coincidentally enough, the company I'm going to work for, this was part of my name, a grade one insulation installation trainings I used to give. And I, I left it in Spanish for a couple of reasons. One, 99 out of 100 insulation installers in Texas prefer Spanish over English as far as their primary language. And number two, it give, gives me an opportunity to talk about this. And ultimately, I know most of you folks on the webinar today are code officials, uh, plan reviewers, HERS raters, inspectors, a handful of HVAC contractors. Um, but I, I, again, I just don't want you to underestimate the job you guys do. It's important. It really is. And, and it's, you know, that extra $25 or $30 a month on an energy bill because the HVAC is oversized and it's short cycling and, and it's an energy penalty. You know, the single mom or the little old couple on a fixed income, that 25 bucks a month, every single month while they live in that house, it can be a really big deal. And I know change is hard in the building department. Change is hard, I know it's hard, but it, right sized HVAC equipment and some of the things that Russ is gonna talk about today it can actually kind of pay for itself because if you put a two and a half ton system in and install it correctly with good duct layout, well, you're, you're going to save enough money over that four ton you were just going to slap in there to, to offset the cost of a third party uh, designing the system for you. Or heck, this the software that Russ has invented that I'll, I'll show a little video clip of at the end, it's $300 a year. So you, they, you, you buy that. And you're more than offset. So again, I wanna encourage all the inspectors, please consider requiring a manual J load calculation at permit. It's just, it, it, it's just something I really encourage you to do. And I've got one more slide and then I'll turn it over to Russ. And this is part of the reason why, not, not only is it important for the homeowner, what's well, important for Texas as a state as well. This, this is, y'all probably seen this before. This is the load profile coming out of ERCOT. This is in Dallas on a 62 degree day. This is how much load is on the system, right? Well, on a 106 degree day, well, large commercial and industrial, it goes up a little, small commercial about doubles. Well, what happens with residential? A bunch of, if, if all of this was properly sized equipment that was running all day, you know, running 20 hours of the 24 hours, well, while equipment's running, it pulls a whole lot less load than when it's starting and stopping and starting and stopping. So you're, help, you're not only helping the single mom on the, uh, you know, or the little old couple on a fixed income, you're also helping your state. And it's, it really should be at very little or no cost to the builder because that offset in the less expensive, smaller equipment can be, can be more than offset by a proper design. So that, that's my spiel. I know y'all have heard it before, but I'm going to keep saying it until I talk every single jurisdiction in the state of Texas into swapping over. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Russ. Russ, I, I typically don't le read a long formal introduction, but tell us who you are, what you do. And, oh, here you go. Perfect. It, the floor awesome. is yours, good sir. <laughs> awesome. Thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Happy to be here. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's uh, a little early here in California, a little after 7 a.m., um, but always, always happy to uh, to share the good word. 
Um, my name is Russ King. I'm a licensed mechanical engineer in three states. I've been doing um, load calc since 1988, before there was even software to do it. I, I was, uh, the very, very early manual J calculations were a worksheet that you had to fill out by hand. Um, I'm the CEO and founder of Coded Energy Inc. We're the developers of uh, Quick Model 3D. It's a residential load calc and duct design software. Uh, my career, I've run two different mechanical engineering firms that specialize in any for large production home builders. In that time, I probably designed, oh, two to 3,000 plans. Each of those was a, was a tract home. So it was a master plan and built many, many times, some of them up to 50 or 60 times uh, in a subdivision. I've also diagnosed um, hundreds of houses that were designed by other people, and that's always very educational. I wrote a book called HVAC 1.0, Introduction to Residential HVAC Systems, and I have an HVAC blog called russellking.me if you're interested in that kind of stuff. Um, so this presentation is uh, actually one I put together for an organization here in California called Bayred. Um, and they've allowed me to, to, to use a presentation and show it to you guys. So I wanted to give them a little bit of a plug. Um, as you might know, or you may have heard rumors, uh, California has very, very strict energy standards. It's called the Title 24 Part 6 Energy Code. Uh, it's updated every three years. We're about to go into a new cycle on January 1st of this year. And it's the most stringent energy code in the country. Um, the 2019 code was the first code um, that required photovoltaics on all new homes. And um, I go to a lot of the Energy Commission hearings, and that was the first Energy Commission hearing when they formally adopted that code that had lots and lots of uh, uh, TV cameras and news crews and radio stations and all kinds of, of um, media uh, folks were at that hearing because it was such a big deal. Um, it, uh, the code, you know, it has done some good stuff. It, it's, it's, the intent is good. The, the people that develop have good intentions. Uh, it's the implementation that's always very challenging, um, but um, we're, we're making do and I think, uh, I think you know, um, you, if you look and see, I think California has, the second lowest energy use per capita of any state. And we're second only to Hawaii, which is an island out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. So obviously they're gonna have very low energy use, uh, but we're substantially lower than, than the next one above us too. So um, we've done a really good job reducing energy use and you know we have lots and lots of people. So grid um, uh, resiliency and reliability is extremely important. Uh, Bayren is a uh, organization that uh, gets funding uh, from ratepayer utility funding. And um, it, it's made up of the nine counties that touch the San Francisco Bay. And we train all the building departments, county and city building departments within those counties. And we have all kinds of energy code training and, and stuff like that. And um, the, the enforcement of the energy code is quite good in the Bay Area, if I, if I may say so. Um, so this class is um, basically, it's, a, it's actually a new class and it's training building departments how to enforce the code that requires load calculation and duct design for new HVAC systems. So it's actually written right into the California Energy Code that you have to do ACA Manual J. And I'll explain what ACA is, what Manual J is and all that stuff. Uh, we also have something called the Green Code, uh, which requires Manual J, S, and D. And these have been in place since 2013, so almost 10 years now. And it's only been in the last few years um, that um, enforcement agencies have started kind of, you know, noticing it and requiring it. And one of the things I think that's really made it um, more important now than it has been uh, in previous years is that a lot of, there's a lot of incentives and a lot of programs to get people to switch from gas furnaces over to heat pumps. And the thing about heat pumps is, you know, they probably have a bad reputation where you are. You've probably heard horror stories about them. But I will tell you from personal experience that all of those horror stories are due to bad design. It's not due to the equipment, it's due to the design. And if you don't do a good design on a heat pump, it will have all those problems. And so as we're, you know, unless we want, you know, just some horrible PR going on with all these uh, switching over to heat pumps and stuff, uh, good design is, is that much more important, okay? And honestly, I will tell you, and every HVAC contractor I talk to, I say, hey, you know, it doesn't matter that this is a code requirement. You should be doing it anyways. This is just good practice. 
Um, we have some very strict things in California, and I talk to a lot of contractors all over the country. I'm on, you know, some discussion groups and Facebook groups, and I teach classes and blogs and and uh, all kinds of stuff all over the country. And it's interesting. A lot of contractors outside of California really like what we do in California because it levels the playing field for the good contractors, the contractors who want to do it right. And there's just so many contractors out there who just always take shortcuts and it makes it harder for the better contractors to, to, to have a good, excuse me, have a good business model. So, you know, contractors really should be doing this correctly. But I will also tell you that manual JS and D are very complicated. They're not easy to learn. The software is complicated, which is why I designed a, a new software is to make it as easy as possible. Um, but um, it is a challenge. So, so that's just kind of the, the, the challenge that we have is, is we have to train people uh, and get them used to doing it. We also have to simplify the process as much as we can. Uh, this is just the actual code language here in California. And you can see there, it specifically mentions Acta Manual J. Okay. Hey, Ross, yeah, now you yeah. just said California and simplifying the process. I don't, I, that's kind of, that, those two <laughs> things don't go in the same sentence, do they? And just to clarify everyone, JS and D has been in the IRC for 30 plus years. This isn't just in the California Green Code. This has been required for single family construction for decades. So this, this, this should be nothing new to the HVAC contract. Yeah, and, and thanks for thanks for stopping me and asking for clarification. What I was getting at is in order to get people to do it, we need to simplify the code and we need to train them and we need to, you know, there's there's kind of this three-prong approach. Uh, and what I'm learning from, from you know, having, being a software developer now is that there are a lot of HVAC contractors who are simply computer ignorant. They don't know the difference between a zip file and a folder on their computer. And they'll never, no matter how simple you make the software, uh, they'll never be able to do it. So one of the things we're also working on is a service where we provide load calcs and duct design for HVAC contractors that's quick and cheap, you know, probably cheaper than their time that they would put into doing it themselves. Um, and so, you know, it takes, it takes a lot of uh, different approaches to make the entire process better and faster and just get people to follow it. So yeah, that's a great idea, especially just watching that little video of your software, getting that, developing that as a service and the way you can drag and drop those plans. I mean, that just seems like a marriage made in heaven. I'm, I'm looking forward to that going forward. Let me know when that's live because I'll certainly awesome. push it out to my folks. Will do. Will do. All right. So one of the things that, that does apply to everybody who's doing a load calc is picking your design temperatures. Okay. And um, our code actually specifies which design temperatures to use. And it's a little different than Manual J, but if you just follow Manual J, it will tell you which design temperatures to use. So the heating design temperature is something that's called the winter median of extremes. And it's listed for each city will have all these design temperatures. And Manual J will say for heating, use this one and for cooling, use this one, okay? And now let's talk about that for a second. What exactly is this temperature that we're designing to? If, um, uh, if you were designing a, a, an air conditioner for your own house and someone asks you, well, what temperature do you want your air conditioner to work at? You would say, well, heck, I, I want it to work on the hottest day we've ever had, right? Whatever the highest temperature is that we've ever had, I want it to work on that day. Well, the problem with designing it to something like that is it's very, very rarely that temperature. In fact, the temperature that we design to is called for air conditioning is called the one percentile temperature. And that means that by definition, it is actually hotter than that temperature 1% of the time. And that's not very much, but you would look at that temperature and say, you know, you're designing to 95 and we hit 100 last week. Why are we designing to such a low temperature? And if you look at the graph of outdoor temperature, it rises up, it peaks, and it drops down. And so it's only at that really hot temperature for a very, very short period of time. And the actual load on a house lags behind the outdoor temperature. So the outdoor temperature can rise up and peak, but the house will never really sense that because of things called thermal mass inside the house. The house has the ability to sort of store that coldness, if you will, um, and, and, and not be really affected by short spurts of, of outdoor temperatures. Now, when you get these 
what we call heat storms, where it's really, really hot for a long period of time, that's when you potentially have problems. But there's other things you can do. When you do a load calc on a house, you know, you assume that some of the curtains and drapes are open. And by closing those drapes, by not running, you know, um, fans and stuff like that, by being careful about opening doors and windows, you can actually substantially reduce the load of your house and have your house be perfectly comfortable doing those, those really hot, hot seasons. Okay, so somewhere in uh, Manual J, there's a list of all the cities. Um, California has its own list. Uh, that's, that has a lot more cities in it and stuff like that. So that's where those temperatures come from. Uh, as I mentioned, the cooling temperature is what's called the one percentile. There's a dry bulb temperature, and then there's something called the mean coincident wet bulb. California has 16 distinct climate zones. Uh, we have places like Truckee, California by Lake Tahoe, that the design temperatures are comparable to, to a lot of places in Alaska. And then we have, you know, Death Valley and Palm Springs and Palm Desert, which are some of the, the hottest um, design temperatures in the country, hotter than a lot of places in Arizona, if not the hottest in the country. So we have a real variety. The one thing we don't have is hot, humid climates like you guys have, you know, down in Galveston and Houston and stuff like that. We have, we have um, cooler, humid climates on the coast like San Diego. Um, we just don't have really hot, humid, but that humidity is factored in with this mean coincident wet bulb. That's what's the, the wet bulb temperature of the outdoor air. And that's what adds humidity to your house when you do when you do your load calculations. Okay, so why is this all important? Well, you know why is it important to do load caps? It it really is. A lot of people don't realize this, but it really is a health and safety issue. If you look at the statistics of how many people die when when there are heat waves and you know when power goes out and things like that, and so properly sizing equipment, making it work is a health and safety issue, okay? Um, energy efficiency, that's what help makes our grid more stable and prevents a lot of those, those blackouts and brownouts and things like that. Oversized equipment will not only use more electricity, it's running at below optimal performance, all right? I'll, I'll show you some things. There's a lot of things wrong with oversized equipment. Undersized ducts, undersized ducts, as opposed to the equipment, reduces airflow, which reduces efficiency and capacity. And what has happened in most of the country is over the years, the fear of undersizing equipment has driven up the size of the equipment and the desire to keep the cost down has reduced the size of ducts because one of the biggest costs of installing a duct system is labor. And, and small ducts are easier and faster and cheaper to install. So over the years, what has happened is equipment has gotten bigger and ducts have gotten smaller. And that's a really bad combination, okay? Uh, and then of course, the other thing is comfort. Um, I've been involved in a lot of defect litigation lawsuits. I always represent the builder, uh, always on the builder side, but I've been involved in a few of those. And the reason for those lawsuits started off with comfort complaints. The homeowners were not happy and the installing contractor could not make them happy and the builder could not make them happy. They hire an attorney and they sue the builder and then they find all these other issues that's wrong with the house and it just gets really, really ugly. But a lot of those, those defect litigation lawsuits start because of comfort complaints. So this is all very important. Um, so let's talk about equipment sizing. The importance of good design related to equipment sizing. Um, you have to do a load count to properly size heating and cooling equipment. You've probably heard the old 500 square feet per ton and you know, some of the more progressive installers say, oh, we do 600 square feet per ton. Well, that's not a load count. Square footage of the house has very, very little to do with the load of the house. The windows have more to do with the load of a house and the direction they're facing than the square footage of a house. So to size an air conditioner based on the square footage of the house is actually kind of dumb. Uh, I would be much more respectful of a contractor who says, oh, I do so many tons per square foot of glass, or I, you know, I look at west facing glass, that's how I size air conditioners. I would have much more respect for that than sizing based on square footage. But even that is not accurate enough. You have to do a load count on a house, okay? Now for air conditioners, if you were to make a mistake in your load count and undersize an air conditioner, and that means the capacity of the air conditioner is less than the load on a design day, okay? That one percentile day, if you undersize it, 
the ha that air conditioner is going to work very well on all but the very hot days. So most of the time, that undersized air conditioner will not will, will work fine. It's only on those really hot days that it doesn't work. Now, if you oversize an air conditioner, that causes excess stratification. It causes uneven temperature distribution, plus higher electric bills and short equipment life. So oversized air conditioners will cause comfort complaints on the mild days, which is most of the time. So, you know, it's just the natural fear is to think, oh, I, I want to play it safe. And, and when someone says, I want to play it safe, they usually mean I want to put in a bigger air conditioner than I, I think I might need. OK, so it's always playing it safe by going bigger. Well, oversizing air conditioners will, and I can guarantee you this, will cause more comfort complaints than if you were to undersize the air conditioner. And very few contractors realize that. But don't undersize, don't oversize, properly size. And the way to properly size is to do a load count and size your equipment based on that load count, okay? For heaters, heat pumps, or furnaces, again, if you undersize, the house will work fine. It'll only not heat well on the very cold days. But oversizing, again, can cause issues on the mild days, which is most of the time. So oversizing will cause more comfort complaints. Um, undersized equipment will work fine on milder days and oversized equipment will perform worse on milder days, which is most of the time, okay? So hopefully I've kind of beat that dead horse and, and uh, convince you that oversized equipment is a problem. All right. So um, let's see, historically, the most common method of equipment sizing was rules of thumb and trial and error. You know, if they just say, oh, let's do the 500 square feet per ton, and then they undersize the ducts, and it's just not working good, and the homeowner complains, they'll say, oh, well, on the next house, let's bump it up half a ton. Maybe we, maybe we undersize. And like I said, that's just leading to oversized equipment and undersized ducts. And that's a very bad combination. That's where you're going to get a lot of the complaints, a lot of humidity issues, uh, a lot of uneven temperatures throughout the house and, and things like that, okay? Now, the other, the other important part of a good design is duct sizing. So if you think about it, you're trying to make the temperature in a house even throughout the entire house, okay? And you're doing that by monitoring the temperature at essentially just one location, which is the thermostat. So in order for the entire house to have, be at the same temperature, while you're monitoring it at one spot, you need to do a good duct design. And what that does is it makes sure that each room gets the right amount of airflow proportional to that room's load. And what that means is you have to do a room by room load calculation. So previously we were talking about equipment sizing and what you typically do for that is something called a block load. And that's a load on the entire house or the entire zone if the house has more than one system. Uh, but when you're sizing ducts, you have to do room by room load calcs because you need to know what the load is on the master bedroom compared to the kitchen, compared to the living room, compared to one of the other bedrooms. Each room is gonna have its own load and each room's load is going to be a percent of the total. So for example, the master bedroom, the load on the master bedroom might be 10% of the total cooling load. And what that means is in order to have even temperatures, if the load is 10%, it needs to get 10% of the airflow. So if your system is moving a thousand CFM, 10% is 100 CFM, you need to make sure that that master bedroom gets 100 CFM in order to have good proper airflow for each room. Okay, so that's how, that's how duct sizing work and that's what manual D is all about. Uh, the target airflows need to be determined by room by room loads. I mentioned that, okay. <clears throat> General undersizing of all the ducts, especially the return ducts, what that does is it reduces total system fan flow, <clears throat> excuse me, and what that does is if you actually look in the air conditioner specs, the, um, the expanded data tables, the capacity tables for air conditioners, as airflow goes down, capacity goes down. So by reducing airflow, you're actually making that air conditioner smaller. The other thing is, is that it actually reduces efficiency. So let's say you bought a, uh, you paid for a three ton, 16 sear air conditioner, but if you severely undersize your ducts, what you're actually getting is maybe a 15 and a half uh, sear, three, two and three quarter ton air conditioner. You're not getting the, the size air conditioner you need or the efficiency because you've undersized the ducts. So that's another important thing. 
Undersizing one or two ducts relative to the other will result in poor air balance. And that's that's what most comfort complaints are is, oh, the, the baby's room is always hot or the, you know, or the, 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 the upstairs is always hot and the downstairs is always cold. All of those are, are have nothing or little to do with equipment sizing. It, oversizing will make those issues worse, but those are uh, poor air balance. And that's where good duct design comes into play, okay? So remember, equipment cannot be properly sized unless you know the load of the house. And that's what manual J is all about. Equipment cannot be properly sized unless you accurately determine the capacity at design conditions. And that's what manual S is all about. So an air conditioner will give you different capacities depending on where it's being installed. What is the temperature? What is the airflow? What is the humidity? And things like that will affect those. So you have to be able to determine the capacity at design conditions and match those to the load calc at design conditions, okay? Ducts cannot be properly sized unless you know how to distribute the air. And the only way to know that is to do room by room load calcs. I've seen, I've seen giant rooms uh, on the north side of the house with a little bit of glass need half as much air as a much smaller room on the west side of the house with a big sliding glass door. So airflow is not proportional to square footage. It's proportional, it has, again, glass area, glass direction and things like that have a much bigger impact. In fact, um, a one square foot of glass is 25 times more important than one square foot of wall in a house. And so glass is very important. And, and again, the only way to do that is to do a load count. So you hear us talking about ACA manual JSD. What is ACA? What is manual JSD? Well, ACA is Air Conditioning Contractors of America. It's the largest HVAC trade association in the United States. They write and publish um, ANSI approved manuals on residential and non-residential HVAC design. And they're pretty much um, recognized as the industry standard for HVAC design. Most of the codes will say, um, you know, do your loads based on ACA manual js &D or equal. Um, manual js &D are actually based on ASHRAE calculations. They've just been sort of customized and tabulated um, to, to make them easier to use, but they are essentially based on ASHRAE formulas and math and things like that, okay? The basic design manuals are JS and D, J is load calculations, S is equipment selection and determining the actual design capacity of an air conditioner and a heat pump, and then manual D is duct design. How do you lay it out? How do you size the ducts? How do you make sure each room is getting the right airflow and things like that? So there's ACA.org, that's their website. Um, you can um, you know, find the books there. Um, if you're going to do design, you pretty much need software to do design. ACA has some approved software that they approve uh, for load calcs and, and duct design and stuff like that. Here are some of the approved, if you go to their website and just search for approved software. So you want to make sure that the software that's being used is approved. Okay. Rightsoft is, I've used Rightsoft since it came out in the early 90s. Uh, Elite came out in the late 90s, uh, maybe early 2000s. Um, ad tech, I don't know anything about them. Uh, my software that my son and I developed is called Quick Model with Energy Gauge Loads. Our load calculation engine is this one here put out by the Florida Solar Energy Center called Energy Gauge. So that's, that's our load calculation engine. It is a, an approved manual J software. And then there's a few others. Um, some of these do um, duct design and load calc. So you wanna make sure um, that the software is approved for whatever they're, they're doing, okay? So you can look these up. Um, here are the, the two most popular Rightsoft. That's probably, if I had to guess, maybe 80% of the market. Uh, Elite is probably about 20% of the market. And then the new upstart in the industry is, is a quick model with energy gauge loads. As you can see, it's 3D. Um, and um, it is ACA certified for Manual J. Um, and I've taught on all of these. I know all these programs very, very well. So. What is the process? What, what goes into a good HVAC design? All right, so we'll talk about a, little, a few definitions. We'll talk about the basic steps. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about heat pumps and then we'll, um, actually we don't have time to go through an example project. I do that in the Bayern class, but um, uh, I can certainly provide that to you. Also, um, if you go to our YouTube channel, the Quick Model YouTube channel, we have a lot of uh, pre-recorded training and stuff like that. If you're interested in, in doing design, I have a lot of very generic uh, design classes on there too that, will work for any software. 
So, you know, what is a BTU? You hear us talk about BTUs all the time. If you take a wooden kitchen match and you strike that match and you let it burn all the way down so you have to let go of it, you've basically released about one BTU of heat into the air. So when we talk about a 40,000 BTU per hour furnace, what that means is it's putting about 40,000 kitchen matches worth of heat into that house in one hour. When we talk about a, you know, a, a 36,000 uh, BTU air conditioner, what that means is it's removing 36,000 kitchen matches worth of heat from the house in an hour. And so a house has a load in BTUs and, it ha and an equipment has capacity in BTUs. And the trick is matching those together, okay? So um, the cooling load is how many kitchen matches come into the house in the summertime. It's hotter outside than it is inside and heat will always go from a warmer place to a colder place. And so the ability to calculate how much heat is going to come into a house when it's a certain temperature outside and a certain temperature inside is exactly what a load calculation is. And when you know that load calculation, then you can pick um, a piece of equipment to match it. Um, when you cool a house, you're actually removing kitchen matches from the house. You're, you're gathering up those kitchen matches by the compression and expansion of a refrigerant. You're gathering those kitchen matches and you're dumping them outside, okay? The heating load is when the house is warmer on the inside and colder on the outside. So heat is naturally gonna move from warmer to colder. So you're losing kitchen matches. So the ability to calculate how fast that's happening uh, is a load count. And then when you're heating a house, you're replacing those kitchen matches. So your furnace needs to replace those kitchen matches at least as fast as they're escaping if you wanna maintain a comfortable temperature. So to maintain a comfortable temperature in a house, the rate of heat coming out of the house must equal the rate of heat going in. And so by the only way to know that is to calculate it and do a load calc on a house. If you oversize equipment, um, when that equipment comes on, it's putting the heat in much faster than it's coming out. So it's going to shut off quickly. So it's going to do what's called short cycling. It's going to run for a little bit, shut off, run for a little bit, shut off, run for a little bit and shut off. And it's inefficient, just like it would be driving that way. Imagine driving down the freeway and slamming on your brakes every mile and then starting up again and then stopping and starting up again. That's exactly what short cycling is like in terms of efficiency. There's also a lot of comfort issues. And I'm gonna show you some interesting graphs in a few minutes, okay? So the capacity of a heating and cooling equipment is the output of the equipment. Think of capacity as the supply, what you're getting from the equipment. And the load, think of that as the demand of the house. So you've got supply and demand. So the ability to properly size equipment is the ability to match the capacity to the load. So in the winter, you're matching the capacity of the heater to the rate that the heat is leaving. And in the summer, you're matching the ability of the air conditioner to extract heat from the rate that is coming in, okay? So that's what property sizing equipment is all about. But the challenge is, like I mentioned, the actual design capacity of an air conditioner is not the same as what we call the nominal capacity. So if we say, oh, that's a two-ton air conditioner, if you look up the definition of a ton, it's 12,000 BTUs per hour. But that's the nominal capacity. That's the capacity of that air conditioner under very precise test conditions. So they call it the two-ton air conditioner. But when you take that two-ton air conditioner and you put it in a really hot climate, it won't give you 24,000 BTUs of cooling. It'll give you something less than that. And then there's this you know, other thing with latent and sensible capacities, and that all comes into play. So it's a little challenging to actually determine the right design capacity of an air conditioner. And that's why manual S is so important, okay? Furnaces are just kind of dumb beasts. They, they'll tell you, you know, what's the output of a furnace and that's pretty much it, unless you go up really, really high altitudes, that drops a little bit. But heat pumps, on the other hand, are much more complicated. Again, that is why good design is so important for heat pumps. So undersizing is defined when the capacity of the equipment is much less than the load of the house or, or just substantially less than the load of the house. It's undersized. So on a design day, it may not keep up, okay? And then oversizing equipment 
is when the capacity of the equipment is much higher than the load of the house. And you've got all this excess capacity that you've paid for, but you probably will never need, okay? So design conditions are the specific indoor and outdoor temperatures at which the loads are calculated. These are not the very worst temperatures expected. These are specified by code. For cooling, it's what's called the one percentile. And for heating, it's, uh, it's this winter median of, of extremes number. Um, and again, don't let contractors arbitrarily increase the design conditions because they say, oh, it, it's gotten really hot lately. It, you have to realize that when they say, oh, that was a hundred degree day, we've had a lot of hundred degree days you know, over the summer and your design temperature might be 95. Well, there might be a lot of days where it hit hundred degrees, but if you look at the actual temperature on that day, it was only hundred degrees for a very, very short period of time. So there's no need to design it to hundred degrees. Design it to 95, and like I said, the house has this lag from thermal mass that even though it hits 100 degrees outside, the house never really senses that because it's only there for a short period of time, and it has the ability to sort of store this coldness in the sheetrock, in the floor, in the furniture, all the thermal mass <clears throat> that's inside a house. If you look back, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm losing my voice, so I'll get a sip of coffee here, excuse me. When, um, if you look back in the, you know, in the 70s when they were designing a lot of these passive solar houses, they were putting a lot of water inside the house, they, these, these big tanks of water and these big blocks of concrete. That was all thermal mass. And what that does is it stores heat and it, it absorbs heat in the summertime. So you, you pre-cool these big blocks of thermal mass. And when the heat comes into the house, it's being absorbed by that. And your air conditioner doesn't have to turn on. It's being absorbed and it doesn't affect the air temperature as much. And so thermal mass is a big deal. We've kind of forgotten about that, you know, with new, new construction and new homes. But even so, there, there still is a pretty substantial amount of thermal mass. Uh, Sheetrock, slab and grade homes have a lot of thermal mass in the slab. So that helps a lot for cooling. All right. Um, let's see. I think I can skip through some of this. I've kind of touched on a lot of this. So what's involved in actually doing a design why is it so complicated why does it take so much time well the basic process for designing a residential heating and cooling system um, is is basically four steps okay the first step is to collect the information about the house you need a set of plans if it's an existing house you may have to go out and sketch the house it doesn't have to be perfect it the main thing is make sure you get the windows correct okay you can sketch the interior rooms. Um, I've showed some examples of some really horrible houses that I've done intentionally bad, and I've been able to convert that into a very accurate model of the house, okay? And do a very accurate load calc, even based on a, on a horrible sketch. As long as, you, as long as you show the dimensions of the walls, get the windows correct, that's the important thing. And then once you have that information, you also need to know you know, what kind of walls, what kind of windows, are they dual pane, metal frame, vinyl frame, are they low E, um, how much insulation is in the walls, um, you know, all that kind of stuff too. Once you have all that information, then your load calcs, and you want to do the room by room load calcs, you do need software. I've done a few load calcs by hand very early in my career, and it was no fun at all. We would spend hours doing a load calc by hand with a calculator, and then my boss would come by and say, oh, that looks great. Now do it with better windows. I'm like, oh my God, are you kidding me? And so you had to go through and, and basically redo the whole thing. And, you know, because it was all, it was all written down on a worksheet. Um, so we had a lot of erasing, a lot of stuff like that. Um, once you do your load count, then you pick your equipment. That's manual S, okay? So you, you, you select your equipment to meet the load. That equipment is gonna have a certain airflow associated with it, assuming it's a ducted system. Okay, a certain airflow at a certain static pressure, at a certain resistance. Then you design your ducts to handle that airflow at that static pressure. So you design your ducts to provide a certain amount of resistance because the, the air handler table says, this air handler will provide this many CFM at a certain amount of resistance. So then you have to design your ducts to not exceed that resistance so that you'll get your target airflow, okay? And that's what manual D is all about. It's time consuming. It, you know, if using the, the current um, software that's the most common software that's out there, 
uh, to do a load calc and full on manual JSD duct design on a house from start to finish is like three or four hours to do a good design, okay? We've tried very hard to reduce that with our software. If you do a lot of these, you can get it down to you know, a couple hours, but still that's a substantial amount of time and effort involved in doing this. And, and it's one of my you know, personal goals as I wind up my career is to, is to try to make this whole process easier. And like I said, there's still some contractors uh, because their lack of knowledge of computers they're just not going to be able to do it. And so we're hoping we can, you know, set up a process where, where there's a, a service where a contractor can just post plans on a website and somebody can really quickly grab those plans and do a load calc and maybe a quick duct, duct design and, and give it back to the contractor in less time uh, and cost than what it would take for them to do it themselves. So we're hoping to get there pretty soon. Okay. All right. So let's talk real quick about heat pumps. I've already kind of mentioned that. There's a lot of incentives in California and probably out there. I know nationwide, there's a big incentive to switch from gas furnaces to heat pumps, okay? If you have solar panels on your house, it's kind of a no-brainer to switch to all electric heat pumps. Heat pump water heaters are very efficient, okay? I won't go into all the details of that, but it's happening, okay? Whether you like it or not, it's happening. And if we don't want people to be really, really upset with their heat pumps. Um, you know, there might be some people that say, yeah, let's let them be upset. And so, you know, I can always go back and say I was right, but that's not helping, you know, that's not helping the public. So what we need to do is we want it to happen. We want it to happen correctly. So heat pumps do have a bad reputation. You know, people say, oh, they blow cold air. Oh, they run on electric resistance strip all the time. They don't work in really cold weather. Those are not the problem of the equipment. Those are the problem of the person who designed the system. The installer who put those heat pumps in is to blame for the problems that these people are having. It's not the equipment. Um, I have friends who live in Minnesota, Minneapolis, Pittsburgh, very cold winters. They have heat pumps on their house. It gets below freezing. It gets close to zero at their house. Their heat pumps work just fine and they're very efficient. Okay, so they do work. Um, they work in California, especially in the Bay Area, they're ideal. We have, we have very mild temperatures in the Bay Area. I actually live over closer to Sacramento where we're up close to hundred degrees, um, but we have fairly mild winters. Um, they're perfect for our climate zone. They're perfect for most of Texas, okay? Um, the actual installed capacity varies widely based on design conditions, okay? So you do need to do a good manual S because this heat pump in this climate zone is gonna work different than that exact heat, same heat pump in a different climate zone, all right? It is especially important that good design practices be followed for heat pumps. Um, in California, we have a lot of forms. I sent Jason a, um, um, a duct design checklist. I can open that up here really quickly and kind of show it to you. So, this is a checklist that we give to building departments to kind of um, show what they need in order to do a good check to make sure that it's, that it's correct. This is kind of a best practice scenario. You don't have to do all this, but it's, it's, it's a good start. You know, you can take this, I, I gave it to Jason as, or as, a, um, um, as a Word doc. So feel free to edit it. Um, you know, the first thing you want is some, is some duck layouts and plans, okay? They can be schematic. They don't have to per be perfect. Most of my career, we provided these big production home builders very detailed, you know, AutoCAD uh, designs that were super precise and everything. To do a quick check, you don't need anything quite that detailed. Okay, it can be schematic. Um, let's see here. Room by room load counts, um, manual J. Um, will have uh, certain forms that are printed out. So you wanna ask for those. It'll show each room. It'll show the load at each room. You wanna check the design standards, make sure those are consistent with um, what your code says. Uh, in California, it's 68 for heating and 75. For most of the country, it's actually 70 for heating and 75 for cooling. These are the indoor temperatures. These are essentially what you're setting your thermostat to. Okay, outdoor design temperatures, um, reference manual J and write down what it is for your jurisdiction. If you're in a county, you might have several different design temperatures. If you're in a city, you're, there's really only one you have to worry about. Write those down and make sure that people do load counts and use those temperatures. 
Um, don't allow them to arbitrarily, you know, bump it up just to just to quote unquote be safe. You know, there's a reason, and there's a long and practiced and tested uh, methodology for using design temperatures, and, and there's no reason to mess around with them. I actually have a blog article that that actually shows how little impact it has, honestly, uh, and how unimportant it is to to you know bump it up a couple of degrees. It just doesn't make that big of a difference in the in the grand scheme of things. Okay. Um, then you want to know, you know, the floor area of the house, the window areas, the U factors, some performance information, you know, infiltration is a big deal in a load count. That's how leaky a house is. In an existing home, the, the leakage of a house could be 30% of your total load if the house is really leaky. Um, one of the things we always recommend uh, for existing home is to tighten up the house as part of changing out the equipment. Um, HVAC contractors, the way I tell a good HVAC contractor is if they own a flow hood for measuring airflow, that's kind of standard. But if they own a blower door, that's a good HVAC contractor. What that means is they go out to an existing house and they test the leakage of the house. And they tell the homeowner, look, your house is really, really leaky. For a few hundred bucks, we can seal it up. And guess what? You can get, get by with a much smaller air conditioner, much smaller furnace or heat pump just by sealing up your house that's a good HVAC contractor. That means they know building science, okay? They understand that a house is a system and they're not just a box swapper like a lot of contractors are, okay? So there's some manual F stuff. And then the last couple of pages, this is actually a, an ANSI ACA uh, design report. This goes into a lot of detail. Um, this is used in a lot of special programs like Energy Star and ResNet ratings and stuff like that. So if you wanna get really detailed, on what goes into a good design, here's a, here's a big long checklist for you. But that first page is probably plenty good for what you need, okay? All right. Um, so the last part of this presentation is something I, I, I wanna show you to, that kind of really illustrates the importance of doing a good design. Um, if you go to my, uh, if you go to YouTube and just search for quick model, uh, you'll find our YouTube channel. And this presentation is on there. It's pre-recorded if you want to watch the whole thing. I'm just going to kind of show you some highlights from it. And this was a result of one of those uh, defect litigation lawsuits that I was involved in. It was a very big production home builder um, that had a big subdivision down in the South Central Valley of California where it gets really hot. And um, in the early energy code compliance, um, they, they decided that the house, in order to comply with the California Energy Code, these houses needed a certain amount of wall insulation between the studs, and it also needed um, rigid uh, board, rigid board insulation on the outside of the studs. And we call that a one coat stucco system out here in California. And you put a rigid foam over the studs and then you put your, your stucco on top of that. Um, and somewhere along the way, the, the builder decided not to put that rigid foam in there. Well, no one discovered that, but at some point in time, these homeowners started having some pretty serious comfort complaints and the contractor couldn't figure out what was going on. The builder couldn't make them happy. And finally, these homeowners in the subdivision, they hired an attorney and they, they filed a class action lawsuit against the builder. Well, I was doing design for this builder for other subdivisions. And so they called me and they said, hey, Russ, we've got this problem out here. We need your help. And so I came out and I did a load calc on these house. And, and, and by the way, the, the attorney started, started pulling all the permit information, all the paperwork on this project and discovered that they had not installed that rigid foam insulation. So immediately they went, aha, that's the problem. We don't have this foam insulation. Our air conditioners are clearly undersized and that's why we're having all these problems. And so the bill was like, ah, shoot, we really messed up. How bad is the problem? All right, so they hired me. I did a load calc on these houses and I found that even without that rigid foam insulation, the air conditioners were oversized by as much as 30%, okay? Even without that foam insulation, the air conditioners were way oversized. These were good sized houses. They had um, two systems, one for the upstairs, one for the downstairs, and both systems were oversized, okay? Severely oversized. And that was, was, was actually causing the problems. And so I said, hey, your problem is oversized equipment. It's not the lack of this rigid board insulation. Your solution 
is to downsize the condensers. And if you downsize the condensers, now your ducts might be properly sized for the, for the tonnage of the equipment. Well, that went over like a, like a lead balloon. Imagine telling a homeowner, oh, your, your house is not comfortable. What you need is a smaller air conditioner. And, I had a conversation um, it, just yesterday <laughs> that I had a lady call me, we got a brand, a new house. And she told me, uh, she was certain. First thing, well, we're not comfortable because it's oversized. I was like, no, your ducks are probably, I go, it sounds about right. I go, I bet your return is grossly undersized. And, and I know this particular builder and it's in a jurisdiction where they don't enforce the testing. And I go, I bet your ducks are leaky. And, and this builder wraps the exterior of their studs with that cheap perf, uh, perforated builder wrap and there's no blower door test. And so I go, I bet you're probably 20 ACH. And I explain all this to her. I go, I, I know you think it's undersized, but I bet you there's, I bet you anything, it's a variety of other problems that are causing your yep. comfort problems. Yep, yep. So what did they replace the foam board with? The builder, I'm curious. Uh, nothing, nothing. Well, they, uh, they, well, what they ended up doing, they, <laughs> I was really upset. I mean, what they put the stucco on though? Um, Just, oh, they did, a, they did a three coat stucco. The, the regular stucco that they normally do over the over the studs yeah so yeah, it, so they just two similar. layers of felt and then wire on the exterior of the studs yep and then, and then, and then a do, three coat then oh do, yeah yeah they do something called a scratch coat and then something yeah, yeah, else yeah. and then a like, yeah i've been like, doing like stucco trainings lately too <laughs> yeah yeah another problem um, boy we, we could get into a whole nother multiple hour how wow we're doing stucco wrong but anyway i, I, yeah. I digress go ahead sorry <laughs> no problem so 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 imagine you know telling these homeowners yeah your problem is your equipment's too big and you need smaller equipment and you know they're all up in arms and they have their attorney and everything well that didn't go over very well and so i said well you know the only way to prove it to you is to monitor your houses is to actually monitor the outdoor temperature the indoor temperatures and when the equipment runs okay and so I proposed doing monitoring these houses using something called data loggers, okay? And the data loggers that I use are these, they're called Dixon, D-I-C-K-S-O-N, Dixon data loggers. They're little tiny things. They're about the size of a book of matches. Uh, they come in 12 packs. They're about 60 bucks each. And I put, I put a whole bunch of them in these houses. Each system, I put six to eight data loggers per system in these houses. Well, the, the interesting thing was they... The, the attorney wanted me to monitor like 11 houses all at the same time. So I had to buy a ton of these data loggers in order to do that. But I got some really interesting uh, readings, okay? You can buy them that, um, that do um, um, temperature and humidity. You know, we always joke around and say humidity is not allowed by code in California. They outlawed humidity. Um, obviously, that's a joke. But, uh, um, you know, you, if you can buy these where they'll measure humidity too, also, some of the newer ones, like Hobo has a really nice one that's Bluetooth. You can leave it in place and it will connect with the home's Wi-Fi. You can monitor it from a distance and all that stuff. They're, the technology has really improved since I've done these, these tests. But anyways, that's what they look like, okay? I, where do I put those in a house? Well, I put, um, I put one right next to the thermostat. And that, what that does is it tells me the temperature at the thermostat, okay? And then I ask the homeowner, I say, what rooms are your problem rooms? Which rooms are you complaining about? And I'll put a data logger in each of those problem rooms. But it's also important to ask them, when these rooms are not comfortable, what rooms are comfortable? What are your most comfortable rooms in your house when the other rooms are not comfortable? And then I'll put a data logger in those as well. Then the other one that's very important is you put one right directly taped to the face of a supply register. You take one of those data loggers and you put it right on that supply register so that when the air conditioner turns on, that data logger will sense that really cold air will suddenly start coming out of that register and it will drop very rapidly. And then when the system turns off, it will start to rise very rapidly. And you can see that. It'll tell you exactly when the air conditioner turns on and when the air conditioner turns off, okay? And then the other thing I do is I put one outside. On the north side of the building in the shade, you don't want the sun to shine directly on it, but you want it to monitor the outdoor temperature, okay? So I put up all these data loggers. You can set them to take a reading every two minutes or four minutes, whatever. I think I set it at two minutes. And, um, and then it'll run for you know a couple of weeks. And then you collect all the data and you graph it out. And this is what it looks like, okay? So this red line here is the outdoor temperature. Now this city, 
the design temperature of the city was 99 degrees. If you look it up, it was 99 degrees. But you can see that the outdoor temperature actually exceeded the design temperature. So that's perfect monitoring conditions. That's what you want to see. That will tell you exactly you know, whether the equipment is oversized or not. So that red line is the outdoor temperature. These other lines are indoor rooms, okay? The green line is the thermostat set temperature. And I told all these homeowners that, in fact, I had them sign a document. I had them sign a little disclaimer saying, I will set the thermostat at a comfortable temperature that I like, and I will not touch it during this test. I promise to leave the thermostat alone during this test, okay? And, um, and so whatever that temperature was, I, I put a green line. In this particular house, they liked it at 76 degrees, okay? Well, this room got up almost to 80 degrees. This room here got a little bit high, you know, 77, 78 degrees, okay? But they didn't complain about those rooms. Those were the rooms they considered comfortable rooms. They did not complain about that, that which was interesting, okay? Now, this was another house. They liked it at 76 degrees. And you can see this room is rising up a little bit, getting a little warmer. You can also tell which side of the house a room is on by when it peaks. If it peaks later in the afternoon, it's probably on the west side of the house. If, it's, if it peaks earlier in the day, it's probably on the east side of the house and so on. Okay, so you can kind of tell. Um, so we got these, um, these rooms. Again, the homeowner did not complain about these rooms. Here is a room that they did complain about, okay? So this room here, this brown line, you can see is well above the green line, which is, they actually, they actually set their set, thermostat to 78 degrees. And this room got up to 82 or 83 degrees and never really came back. It never recovered. It always stayed well above the temperature. So that's a valid complaint. That The homeowner has a right to complain about a room like that. That is not good. That is not what you want to see, okay? And you see, even at night, so here's the daylight hours from, you know, roughly 6 a.m. to 7, 8 p.m. Um, even at night, the outdoor temperature gets well below, it gets down to 70 degrees. The outdoor temperature gets well below the thermostat set point. Even so, this room never cooled off, all right? Some interesting things going on here. Now, had they opened a window and let that room cool with 70 degree outside air, it would have done that. But that's, you know, you can't tell homeowners, oh, the only way you're going to be comfortable is if you open out their windows. That's not what you're designing to. You're designing that a house can stay with the windows, you know, closed. Ventilation, indoor air quality ventilation, that's a whole nother topic, mechanical ventilation. Um, but you can't expect a homeowner to, to open and close windows to make a room comfortable, okay? That's not their responsibility. Um, so this was a valid complaint. And so the question is, what's going on here? All right, why is it doing this? Here's another house, very valid complaint. This room got up to 88 degrees in the afternoon when the thermostat was set to 78 degrees. They had every right to complain about that. This blue room got pretty hot, okay? Now, why is it doing that? And what I contend is that the equipment is oversized and they didn't believe me. So how do I prove that it's oversized? Well, look at this pink line here. This pink line, is the temperature of the air coming out of the supply register. We call those icicles. So when this temperature drops like this, you see this down, sharp downward spike, that is the air conditioner turning on. So the air conditioner turns on, the supply air temperature drops down, and when you hit that little peak at the bottom and it starts going back up, that tells you that the air conditioner turned off. So now the temperature is rising back up. So when it comes down, it's on. When it goes back up, it's off. So on, off, on, off, on, off, on, off, on, off. On, on, on. Look at all these spikes. That is a classic example of short cycling. And look at the outdoor temperature is well above the design temperature of 99 degrees. It, if this was properly sized equipment, when it went above 99 degrees, it sh this pink line should drop down and stay down and run continuously until it cools off and then come back up. And what you'll find is the, you don't have these peaks. What happens is these rooms start to stray away and every time the air conditioner shuts off, it, it rises a little bit 
it runs for a little bit and it kind of ratchets up and it ratchets up and it ratchets up and it ratchets up. That is a classic example of what you get when you short cycle. The rooms that are not getting the proper airflow get worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. Had the, even if the airflow was lower than it was supposed to be, had the system run for a long period of time, you would not get this spike because it would go up and it would stay, it would, it would hit a few degrees above the set temperature and it would stay there. It wouldn't keep rising, okay? So that's a classic example of oversized air conditioner. And that's what you get, that's very common. Now, this was a very dry climate. Had this been in a humid climate, not only do you have temperature issues, but that short cycling reduces the air conditioner's ability to remove humidity, to remove moisture from the air. Not only will you get uncomfortable temperatures, you'll get very uncomfortable humidity inside this house. And then the, the, the tendency is to, is to drop this set point down to like 70 degrees. Now, what are we doing? We're just running oversized equipment longer. We're wasting energy. We're putting stress on the grid and all that other kind of stuff, okay? So it's very, very important. This is a, a classic example of oversized equipment, okay? Yeah, I'm gonna have to steal a couple of those slides for some of my presentations going forward. I have a similar one that I got from uh, Energy Vanguard blog and it's a similar data logger tells a story. Yep. But mm -hmm. I, I might have to Photoshop out this 78 degrees because in Texas, we pretty much consider Californians crazy people, but setting your mm -hmm. thermostat at 78 degrees in the summer, that's pretty much confirmation. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> it's like 70 and 72 for most folks here. Yeah, yeah. I'm a 75 guy, but I'm just cheap. Yeah, the, the, um, the design temperature is 75. That's what we're required to design to. This particular homeowner just liked it at 78. That's why, that's why we had, but yes, well, they and were. The other one was 78 and the two other ones were 76. I mean, that just yeah. that doesn't happen very often here. Yeah, no, that's true. But it's a dry heat, right? It's a dry heat. <laughs> big, yeah. big difference. Yeah, yeah, big yeah. difference. Yeah. Um, this is interesting. This is kind of zoomed in, okay? And this is why I refer to data loggers as lie detectors. You know, I told you someone, I had them sign a piece of paper promising me they wouldn't touch the thermostat, okay? And they, they said, oh yeah, we promise, we promise. And then I went and picked up the data loggers. They swore up and down, oh, we didn't touch the thermostats. We promise, we promise. Well, I can tell, <laughs> I can tell they were lying by graphs like this, okay? So the green line is the temperature at the thermostat. And they told me that they were gonna keep it at 75, 76, whatever, the, whatever it was. But if you look at the, the pink line is the supply air temperature. So if you look, the air conditioner turned on when the temperature at the thermostat was 90 degrees, almost 90, like 89 degrees. So when the green line was 89 degrees, the air conditioner comes on. So they let the house get up to 89 degrees and then they dropped the thermostat. I don't know what they dropped the thermostat down to until I follow this pink line and see when it turned off. So it turns off right here. And when it turned off, the thermostat was at 84 degrees. So they had dropped their thermostat from whatever it was here down to 84 degrees, and that's when it turned off. So I can tell what their thermostat set points are. And then the house, the house, then they turn their system off again, and their house warms up, warms up, warms up, warms up. The house gets up to over 90 degrees, and then they turn it on again. And now the, now the air conditioner drops down and look how long it runs for. It runs from five o'clock till almost eight o'clock at night. It runs for three hours straight. That's this big long drop here. Now this is another interesting thing is look at the supplier temperatures in the first hour. When it turns on at five o'clock, the supplier temperature drops to here. And the longer it runs, the colder that supply air temperature gets. So that's another thing that people don't realize is it takes a while for an air conditioner to run and reach its optimal performance, its optimal capacity and its optimal efficiency. It takes a while. You know, it's like it, two whole hours. Wow. That's that's three hours there. And it probably yeah. could have dropped even farther. Yeah. Um, wow. So if you're if your system is shutting off every 30 minutes, it's never running in this high performance mode down yeah, here. I That's never, I never reason. talk about that. I, I didn't realize that it took that long. I, I didn't realize that it kept incrementally getting cooler over that length of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's other things come into play too is no, your, your ducts get colder. Um, a lot of these ducts are running through 
you know, between floors and in the walls and stuff like that. And those walls start getting colder. And so your supplier temperature continues to drop and drop and drop. But if you were to also monitor the sear rating of an air conditioner over time, the sear rating gets better the longer it runs, okay? And it takes a while to hit that. You know, if it's rated for 16 sear, it takes a while to get that 16. It might be a 14 sear air conditioner in the first 30 minutes. And so if you shut off after 14 minutes, you know, after 30 minutes, you're never hitting that optimal sear rating yeah. either. And, so and if you're short cycling, you've got a nine sear AC. Welcome, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And so then they set their temperature and you can see that it starts going up and down and they're, they're messing around with their thermostat. Oh, here's another interesting thing. Let me go back to this slide. Notice this short cycling during the day. And here's the outdoor temperature. So, you know, it, the sun comes up about seven in the morning and you really see the outdoor temperature goes from 70 degrees and it shoots up whew, all the way up to over hundred degrees within one, two, three, four, five, six, about seven hours, you know, at three o'clock it peaks out. Okay, and then it drops back down, the sun goes down and the temperature drops and the outdoor temperature gets well below the thermostat setting of 78 degrees, okay? It's, it's 70 degrees outside at night, okay? Or, or gets down to 70 degrees. But look at the air conditioner. Why is the air conditioner still running? It's still coming on even when it's colder outside than it is inside. Why is that air conditioner still running? Well, the other problem that these houses had is they had bad attic ventilation. The attic was trapping all this heat during the day. And even at night, that heat from the attic was coming into the house, making the air conditioner turn on even when it was cooler outside than it was inside. Okay, so that's, a, that's another issue that you'll see. It's, yeah, it's I've just written a like ton that. of red tags for underventilated attics. It's just It's just a... That's the, 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 it's the exception to have a properly ventilated attic, not the rule. Yep, exactly. You know, the, the one to 150, one to 300 rule. I actually mm -hmm. did some research. You know what those, you know, where those numbers came for, came from, why they picked one to 150, one to 300. We did a webinar on it, but I can't remember. Tell me. It's to prevent ice dams. That's what oh. that's for. Oh, yeah, that's gonna, that's helpful dams. in Texas. Thanks a lot. Uh, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In California too. So, well, so and, and a lot of times what built what code inspectors don't realize that one to 150 and one to 300 that's net effective opening and and a yes. lot of times i mean yep. if you're looking yeah. at a 12 inch by 12 inch static roof vent well that net effective opening might be 0.37 square feet so you need three mm -hmm. times as many of those those aren't one square foot of opening in other words exactly exactly yeah yeah that's huge um so the so the, the, the reason we want attic ventilation is to get the heat out of the house. And it turns out that the optimal amount of attic ventilation for that purpose is a lot more than the code requirement, which is to prevent ice dams. And so, you know, and there's, you know, there's currently no, there's no code that says if you're in a hot climate, you need, you know, one to 50, you know, vent area or something like that. Um, we need to it's, change that it's, in the code. That, that's a code change proposal coming for sure. <laughs> Yeah. You know, and there's some, you know, you know, a lot of people say, well, what about attic fans? I, I'm actually, I'm actually a big proponent of attic fans, not the, not the big um, Home Depot, you know, um, uh, AC 110 volt, you know, fans that'll, that'll, you know, create a real negative pressure in your attic. What I like are the solar fans, the, the solar powered fans. They're, they're ideal. The, you know, the sun comes up, they turn on, the sun goes down, they shut off. That's perfect. That's exactly what we want. They're very low. CFM, they don't create a negative pressure. What happens is if you create a real negative pressure in the attic, it, it actually, your, your attics leak a lot. They're, I should say your ceilings leak a lot. If you've got can lights in your house, those leak like crazy. Mm -hmm. um, between the, the wall sheetrock and the top plate of the studs, air leaks around there. So the air will go into an outlet and go yeah. up the wall and go into the attic that way. There's tons of leaks. So you don't want to depressurize or pressurize for that matter. Yeah, so those I, those little those solar power, yeah, those high power vent fans that those cause so many more problems than they yep. than they fix. Yep, but the little solar ones I think are really good. I, I really like those. Now, uh, those and what about I like the whirly birds too. Just the that mm -hmm. that move air just from the heat rising. Yep. Rather yep. than static, just the static ones are terrible. Yeah, there's a lot of the ones um, like O'Hagan vents. They're 
uh, have you heard of O'Hagan vents? They're, no, they're beautiful. They're, they're, um, they're, they're disguised to look like a tile. And so you can't see them from the outside. They're designed to look nice, right? Mm -hmm. The problem is they have very, very low net free vent area, like you mentioned. And so you need mm -hmm. a ton of them. You need lots and lots and lots of them. They look great, but you need a ton of them. You need a whole yeah. bunch of them to get good ventilation. Yeah. Um, all right. So that pretty much wraps up my presentation. Um, there's our website. Um, there's my blog. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, there's my email, russetcodedenergy.com. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you guys and, and uh, share, share what we've learned out here in California and hopefully um, convince you that, uh, first of all, number one, oversizing is worse than undersizing. <laughs> if, if you take one thing away from my presentation, that's it. And in order to properly size, you have to do a good load calc. In order to do good duct design, you have to do a room by room load calc. So that's the, that's the gist of my, my presentation. No, that, that was fantastic. I'm, I'm definitely going to, uh, to, to take, I, I'm just telling you right now, I'm going to screenshot that one side. I'm, I'm going to steal one of those slides because I, I just love the, the data loggers. Just, it, it just, it proves the stuff I've been preaching. Uh, yes, you will get, so we still have 15 minutes left. Uh, I scheduled this for an hour and a half of ICC CEUs. To get your ICC CEUs, uh, you'll simply fill out the course evaluation. Do, you, do need you to hang out for at least the next 10 of the 15 minutes. If you drop off five minutes early, I, it's not going to hurt my feelings. I do want to show, um, since Russ was very, he wasn't tooting his own horn enough about the quick model software that he's developed. Uh, it's, it's pretty neat guys. Um, I couldn't help, but when you showed the, uh, right soft and the elite and the quick model, that Sesame street song was running in my head. One of these things is not like <laughs> the other, just by looking at, the, at that, uh, static picture. So I just want to show a quick little tutorial video. So for your HVAC contractors, you know, and, and Russ, made a good point you know some of them using computers and software it's just like the end of the world for them but in looking at this i don't know why i i think it would be pretty easy to get somebody at the company to be able to do this under 300 dollars a year so if you don't mind russ i want to give just i'm going to just play about a 10 minutes of your um 101 let me share my computer sound. I just want to show just real quick this software he's developed because I love Alex Meany to death and Write Soft. I've always thought, oh, how cool is that? That's awesome. But after seeing this little first quick model house, anyway, like I said, I'm, I'm going to run about 10 minutes of this and let you guys see this software Russ has developed. Hey everyone, uh, just a quick video to uh, kind of break the ice on all the various features on this uh, uh, house here. It's a really super basic house that I just made up for purely for the purposes of, of demonstrating uh, all the features. So let's first go over the, the basic controls first. Uh, the left mouse is with your index finger is just like any other software. It clicks and highlights things to move them around. The center mouse, which is typically under the wheel, um, that basically slides everything uh, left, right, up and down. So you click it, hold it, and you can move stuff around. And the right mouse um, with your middle finger is a little different. Uh, it's similar, but what it does is it rotates things in 3D. So you can kind of turn things around and look at them from all different angles, like so. Whereas the center mouse just slides things on the screen up and down. The mouse wheel zooms in and zooms out. And if you want it to do that faster, come up here to camera speed and you can change it, make it faster or slower. And then the W key moves in, zooms in even faster. So it's just like a fast zoom. And then the S zooms out. So you can zoom in, zoom out with the W key and the S key, or you can use the mouse as well. And then up here in the right hand, upper right hand corner, we've got these view buttons. So front views from the front, 
right, back, left, it's kind of hard to tell with nothing there, uh, and then top looks straight down. The other one that's, that's useful is this 2D view. Uh, you can check it and uncheck it, and when we get a house on there, you'll see uh, what a difference that makes and how it's useful for in different modes. So let's just click uh, front view, and this is pretty much how the software starts. Uh, it opens up in floor plan mode and elevations. Um, nothing to really do here, but notice how you can set the elevations. The floor is half a foot thick. Uh, we'll assume it's a slab. The rooms are eight feet tall and there's no heel truss. Next thing to do is you click on import floor plan. I love how open easy up this is. A browser. Click on the floor plan for uh, this project, which if you got the, um, the PDF file with all the instructions on it, uh, there's a, um, a floor plan at the top of that PDF. Just take a screen snip of that and then open that file. It'll, screen snips will typically save uh, as a PNG file. You can open PNGs, JPEGs, all kinds of stuff. Okay, so you just open that up and you'll see uh, it's placed in there, but it's not really to scale. So the next thing is to scale it. But you can do that do with that the screen. Do yep. from a it's top awesome. view and then turn off the 2D, or sorry, turn on the 2D, turn off the 3D. And then the next thing is come over here to scale the drawing. And then you'll see these arrows. You gotta look a little close, but you'll see these arrows. Here's one here running left, right. Here's one here running front to back. Those are scaling arrow, arrows. And you basically just, um, line them up with some known dimensions. So I know this is 30 feet across here and it's got the marks and everything. So I'll just get that right on there as close as I can. Um, that looks pretty good. And then down here, I'll just type 30, and hit scale or enter. And now that is to scale. If you count these little blocks, these are one foot square blocks. If you count them, that'll be 30 of those blocks right there. Um, next then we'll do the vertical scale is the Z. The first one, the horizontal scale is the X scale, and this is the Z scale. And then same thing, get as close as you can with the mark. Doesn't have to be perfect. And then that's 20 feet, so we'll change this to 20. Hit scale. Now the house is to scale. So if you were to count those, those would all add up to 20. Alright, the next thing to do is just a fine tuning. Click uh, move floor plan, and then zoom in on the upper left corner. You do whatever corner you want. And all you're really doing is if you see this one foot square grid in the back, you just want to get the drawing lined up as best as you can with that any corner of the grid. So that's pretty good right there. Top view. Next we'll click on room mode. To place a room, you just hit alt click and it'll put a room down and you just want to line up the corners. You can zoom in closely if you want and make sure you're lined up with the drawing like so and on exterior walls you want to line up with the exterior surface of the exterior walls on interior walls it doesn't really matter just get as close as you can so just drag those corners so that it lines up real simple real straightforward repeat for the other rooms Now you notice we've got it, we can put a block here for this hallway, but since it's not going to get a register, it's going to get a return grill, but it won't get a supply register, we'll just include the loads for that in the bath, and all we do is just make the bathroom bigger like that. Now you know this house is 30 by 20, so it's going to be 600 square feet. So according to the plans, this house is 600 square feet. You can check your drawing by coming into the info tab, and you can actually type that in here if you want to but the drawing says 600 square feet. The floor plans say 600 square feet, so we're good to go. If for some reason those two numbers differ, uh, you may have scaled the house off just a little bit, and so you can adjust it there. Next, we're gonna go to window mode to place the windows, and now we want to look at the house in 3D, so we'll uncheck this 2D box, and we'll look at it from the front, and we'll zoom in here, and we see these windows. Here's a 6040, 2020, 4040, and here's a door, a 3068 door. All right, so to place windows, really simple. You just hold the Alt key, click the right mouse, and drag it about the size of the window on the floor plans, and then just type in 6040. And 
the, the distance from the top, let's just call it one feet. That's this up here. That's pretty standard. So this one, 2020, oh, oh, one foot from the top. So easy. Man, I mean, you made it easy. Spin around to the other side of the house or just hit the back key, the back view key. Zoom in with the W key. It's got another 4040. 4040, one foot. Okay, we'll do the doors later. Spin around. Oops, 4030, one foot from the top. Okay, go back to the front. Now let's place a door. Come up here, click doors. And these are 3068. Conveniently, that's what it defaults to. So just place it, go to the back. Same thing. Go back to the front, and that's it. Doors, windows, walls, floors, everything are done at this point. So now we can put a system on here. So go to duck draw, and it defaults to registers. And registers, you just place them by alt clicking. Let's do top view here. And uh, I'm just going to put them in these easy spots for now. We can discuss later why I put them there, what's the best way, place to put registers in a room, and things like that. Uh, that can all come later. Right now, we're just learning how to use the software. Uh, so one more register. I'm going to put a one right here, and this is going to be the return grill. So I'm going to I'm going to give it a good size return grill, so 20 by 30. And uh, tab, by the way, rotates all the registers. Next, I'm going to place the air handler. So click on air handler, alt, click, places it. So the red represents the furnace, the blue is the evaporator coil, uh, the white is the supply plenum, and the gray is the return plenum. So what I want to do now is I'm going to put uh, start collars on the supply plenum and uh, click on start collars. So this is gonna have four trunks and you'll see why later. And if that supply plenum looks a little small, just go back to air handlers, click on it. It's, it's at 24 inches, let's make it 36. Give us a little bit more room. Go back to start collars. The supply plenum is always too small. around however we want to. So I know there's gonna be four trunks on this system, two on each side. I laid this out in advance, just sketched it up. How to design systems will be a different video. Go back to front. Uh, let's see. Let's look at it from the left. Put a start collar on the return. You can barely see it there. Front. Okay. Let's go back to top. Zoom in. Okay. Now I'm going to connect these uh, registers to the supply plenum. So go to duck mode. Highlight the start collar, highlight the register, and hit enter. It's that simple. Uh, they, notice that they turn blue. They both have to be blue in order for the duct to work. And then you can move ducts around with all these different handles like so. Okay. Go back here. Select, select, enter. Select, select. Oops, see, I missed it. Select, select. Okay, now we've got this little register here, and I could just as easily come off of here with a star collar. In fact, that's probably the cheaper way to do it, but I wanted to show you uh, how uh, TYs are done. So TYs uh, are converted from these handles here. So I put the handle about where I want the TY to be, then hit enter, and you'll see this kind of funky looking TY. Uh, hit tab to rotate it around. And then select the end, select the register, and it puts a duct there. Okay, that's a little crowded. You can move this around however you want to. But that's how that's how you do branches off of here. If your ducts get a little uh, bent out of shape, uh, you can always just click on them and move them around and adjust these little handles to make the ducts nice and straight. Or if you select the handle and hit the R key, it'll make the duct straight. All right, let's do the return real quick. Let's make sure you're in duck mode. Highlight, 
highlight, hit enter, and you see how it kind of goes through the furnace. So we definitely have to pull that one out. These green handles, by the way, adjust the angle that it comes off of the connection point. If you want to loosen up the curve coming in, you can you can adjust it like so. And then the handle just moves moves up and down in four directions. If you just grab on the arrow, it'll go that direction too. Okay, there's all the ducks all laid out. Now we need to size them. So now let's go to table mode. If you click on table mode, it opens up into the windows table first. And if you hit this down arrow, you can see all the different tables, walls, doors, ceilings, floors, rooms, blocks, ducts, and systems. So let's start with windows. I've got names, got the block. So the block is the square, the rectangle uh, that it's attached to. Uh, then you can group blocks together to make rooms, but in this house a block is a room because they're they're simple uh, Then you've got the type this will come later Looks like different window types. It's got the direction front left back and right relative to the house It's got the azimuth north south east west based on the north arrow which can be changed you Get the tilt and the area and then what is it touching? What is it adjacent to? All these are all between the house and outside. Also notice, and this is a nice feature, when you go to table mode, it helps to um, get your house kind of lined up in this area right over here where you can see the whole thing from an angle. And then when you come in, you click on these, it will highlight whatever you've selected in the table. So you can hit the first one and there's down arrow and you'll notice how it's as I hit the down arrow it's going right through all the windows okay similarly if you click on a window it will highlight it in the table same thing for walls here's all the walls doors two doors and so needless to say, everyone, those of you that have caught Alex Meany's <laughs> webinars that he's done for us, where he's gone through WriteSoft, I, I think it, it's it's pretty clear that this is this is a uh, a superior design tool. Um, and I can you imagine being an inspector and going out in the field and actually having a 3D, uh, you know, a little eight by 11 PDF of a 3D duct design, how the ducts are supposed to be run, what size they're supposed to be. You know, if you're strapping them up on the rafters or whatever, you can include all that in there. It's not just that flat 2D. Um, just, I mean, fantastic. I'm looking forward to, to letting more fit folks know about that. Russ, I, I can't thank you enough. I mean, just fantastic information today. Uh, any parting words before we call it a day? Nope. Just thank you so much for the opportunity to talk to you guys. I always enjoy um, sharing knowledge with everyone. It's kind of a passion of mine and, and uh, just really appreciate the opportunity. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, everybody. Um, go ahead and take the rest of the day off. Tell your boss I said it was okay. <laughs> thanks. Oh, we have a couple of chats. So just some thank yous. Some great, great. Just some compliments. Thanks, everybody. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.